I've got a Braxus is on religion. Old charcoal Abraxas, said Didactylus, suddenly cheerful again. Struck by lightning 15 times so far. You can borrow this one overnight if you want. This is it, said Om. Come on, let's leave this idiot. He spent years researching it. Went out into the desert talking to the small gods. Talked to some of our gods too, brave man. He says gods like to see an atheist around. Gives them something to aim at. Brother unrolled a bit of the scroll. Is that how people read in Omnia? said Ern. What? Upside down? I think, said Brother, that I'd better be going. I'm sorry to have intruded on your time. He picked up the tortoise, glared at Ern, and strode as haughtily as possible out of the library. Om crawled slowly along the length of a line. This Abraxas was a thinker and no mistake. Do you know how gods get power? By people believing in them. But Abraxas says belief shifts. People start out believing in the god and end up believing in the structure. I don't understand. I am your god, right? Yeah. Take a rock and kill Vorbis. Brother didn't move. You heard me. But he'll... The Quisition would... Now you know. You're more afraid of him than you are of me now. Abraxas says here, around the Godi, there forms a shelly of ceremonies and buildings and authority until at last the Godi dies. But you're not dead. Next best thing. So I've been thinking, you can be the next prophet. I can't. Everyone knows Vorbis will be the next prophet. Ah, but you'll be official. No, I'm not a prophet. No one will listen to me. Om looked him up and down. I must admit you're not the chosen one I would have chosen. Baratha! That's Vorbis. Baratha wandered out into the dusk. Vorbis was sitting on a bench as still as a statue in the shadows. Ah, Baratha. Yes, Lord. Vorbis pointed his staff into the night. Let us walk. There was the sound of laughter somewhere in the darkness and the clatter of pans. The stored heat of daytime radiating from the stones made the night seem like a fragrant soap. If Phoebe looks to the sea, said Vorbis after a while, but the sea is mutable, whereas our dear citadel looks towards the high desert. And what do we see there? Brother turned and looked over the rooftops to the black bulk of the desert against the sky. I saw a flash of light on the slope. Ah, the light of truth. So let us go forth to meet it. Take me to the entrance to the labyrinth, brother. My lord? Yes, brother? I would like to ask you a question. Do so. What happened to Brother Murdoch? There was the merest suggestion of hesitation in the rhythm of Vorbis's stick on the cobbles. The real truth must sometimes be protected by a labyrinth of lies. Do you understand me? No, Lord. I mean, that which appears to our senses is not the fundamental truth. So, did the Ephibians kill Brother Murdoch? In the deepest sense of the truth, they did. By their intransigence, they surely killed him. But in the trivial sense of the truth, Brother Murdoch died, did he not, in Omnia. But it was put about that the Ephibians had killed him in, in the trivial sense, thus giving you due cause to launch a, uh, a just retaliation. The deacon's steel-shod staff clicked in the night. You impress me, brother. I see a great future for you in the church. The time of the eighth prophet is coming. A time of great opportunity for those true in the service of Om. There was more laughter in the darkness and the twang of stringed instruments. A feast, sneered Vorbis. Even their generals are in there. Onward! The gateway to the labyrinth was wide open. Up a short side tunnel, the guide for the first sixths of the way slumbered on a bench, a candle guttering beside him. Brother, yes, Lord, lead the way, I know you can. Lord, 
This is an order, Paratha. Then tread where I tread, Lord, not more than one step behind me. Paratha, let his sleeping mind take control. The way through the labyrinth unrolled in his head like a glowing wire. I could run forward, he thought. I could hide, and he'd walk into one of the pits. Who would ever know? I would. Forward nine paces, and right one pace. Forward nineteen paces. There was a light ahead, yellow lamplight. Someone's coming. It must be one of the guides. Vorbis had vanished. That you, number four? The light came round a corner. An old man walked up to brother and raised the candle to his face. Where's number four? A figure appeared behind the man from out of a side passage. Brother had the briefest glimpse of Vorbis, who gripped the head of his staff, twisted and pulled. Sharp metal glittered in the candlelight. The lights went out again. Take the lead again. Trembling, Brother obeyed. He felt the soft flesh of an outflung arm under his sandal for a moment. After a mere million years, the night air blew cool on his face, and Brother stepped out under the stars. Well done. Can you remember the way to the gate? Miss Lot. The deacon pulled his hood over his face. Carry on. There were a few torches lighting the streets, but passers-by paid them no attention. They guard their harbour, said Vorbis. But the way to the desert? Everyone knows that no one can cross the desert. Ah, the gate. There will be a watchman. Wait here. Vorbis disappeared into the gloom. After a while, Brother started to count to himself. After ten, I'll go back. Another ten, then. All right. And then... Ah, Brother. Let us go. Is there a watchman? Not now. Help me with the bolts. A small wicket gate was set into the main gate. Brother, his mind numb with hatred, shoved the bolts aside with the heel of his hand. The door opened with barely a creak. Outside was the occasional light of a distant farm and crowding darkness. Then the darkness poured in. You'd have to have a mind like Vorbis's to plan it. No army could cross the desert, but maybe a small army could get a quarter of the way and leave a cache of water, and another small army could use that cache to reach halfway, and another small army... It had taken months. A third of the men had died of heat and dehydration. Men were already dying before Brother Murdoch went to preach. You had to have a mind like Vorbis's to plan your retaliation before your attack. Vorbis sat upright in the tyrant's chair. It was approaching midnight. A collection of Ephebian citizens had been herded in front of him. Well, he said, we can now dispense with the peace treaty. Ephebe is now a diocese of Omnia. There will be a fleet here in a few days. He signalled to one of the guards. Who wrote this? A copy of the Chelonian Mobile was flung onto the marble floor. If the philosopher who wrote this does not own up, the entirety of you will be put to the flame. There was a movement in the crowd, and Didactylus stumped out, his barren lantern held defiantly over his head. Brother was standing beside the throne. It was where he had been told to stand. He watched the philosopher pause for a moment, and then turn very slowly until he was directly facing Vorbis. You are the perpetrator. Indeed. You dare to declare that the world is flat and travels on the back of a giant turtle? No. When every honest man knows that the world is a sphere, Brother leant forward, heart pounding. My lord, he said no. That's right, said Didactylus. You deny it? Let it be a sphere, no problem. And the sun can be another larger sphere. Would you like the moon to orbit the world or the sun? But you wrote, you, you gave the turtle a name. Didactylus shrugged. Now I know better. Who ever heard of a turtle 10,000 miles long? But your lies have already poisoned the world. Then I shall write another book. 
a full retraction. In fact, with your permission, Lord, I will retire to my barrel right away and start work. A universe of spheres, balls spinning through space. Mm. Yes, Lord, I will write you more balls than you can imagine. The old philosopher turned and very slowly walked towards the exit. Vorbis watched him go. Then he turned to the tyrant. So much for your gooey! The lantern sailed through the doorway and shattered against Vorbis's skull. Nevertheless, the turtle moves! Vorbis leapt to his feet. I want him caught! Now! And Baratha? Miss Lord? You will take a party of men and you will burn the library. Urn clambered across the shelves like a monkey, pulling books out of their racks and throwing them down. I can carry about twenty, but which twenty? Always wanted to do that, murmured Didactylus happily. Upholding truth in the face of tyranny. One man, unafraid. Damn good shot, considering. The library door shook to a thunderous knocking. The hinges leapt out of the walls. The door thudded down. Soldiers scrambled over it, swords drawn. Ah, gentlemen. Leave him said brother as he stepped over the door but I've got orders said a corporal are you deaf if you are the quisition can cure that you don't belong to the quisition no but I know a man who does you are to search the palace for books leave him to me the corporal looked hesitantly from brother to his prisoners very good corporal I will take over sergeant Simony pushed his way forward go yes sergeant Simony cocked an ear as the soldiers marched away. Then he turned to Didactylus. The turtle moves. I am a friend. Why should we trust you? said Ern. Simony dropped on one knee in front of Didactylus like a supplicant. Sir, I can save you. You have friends in unexpected places. I'll just kill this priest. Baratha backed away. No, I can help too. That's why I came. Vorbis means to burn your library. What can you do? sneered Ern. I can save it. What? Put it on your back and run away? sneered Simony. No. How many scrolls are there? About 700, said Didactylus. How many of them are important? Oh, maybe uh, a couple of hundred. The rest is just vanity publishing. I may be able to take more than that. Is there a way out? There's tunnels all through the rock. What do you intend? I don't believe this, said Ern. You're telling Omnians there's another way out? I'm inclined to trust this person. He's got an honest face. Speaking philosophically, what is your plan, young man? Get the books and... Oh, my God. Something wrong? Could someone fetch my tortoise? Brother looked at a scroll full of maps. He shut his eyes. For a moment, the jagged outline glowed against the inside of his eyelids, and then he felt them settle into his mind. Ern unrolled another scroll, pictures of animals, drawings of plants, and lots of writing. You can remember them just by looking, said Ern. Yes. The whole scroll? Yes. I don't believe you. Describe an ambiguous Pazuma. Don't know. So much for Mr. Memory. He can't read, boy, that's not fair, said Didactylus. All right, the fourth picture in the third scroll you saw. Um, a four-legged creature facing left, uh, a large head similar to a cat's. There are six whiskers. The tail is stubby. He blinked. That was 50 scrolls ago. He saw the whole scroll for a second or two. Brother blinked again. He was conscious of a certain heaviness of mind, a feeling that if he turned his head sharply, then memory would slosh out of his ears. I feel, um, a bit... <sighs> he awoke with the smell of the sea in his nostrils. He was in some sort of shed. Such light as managed to come through its one unglazed window was red and flickered. One end of the shed was open to the water. A few figures clustered around something there. Brother gently probed the contents of his memory. Everything seemed to be there. The library scrolls neatly arranged. You're awake then, said the voice of Om. Where are you? Your soldier friend has got me in his pack. Brother got to his feet and peered out of the window. 
The red light was coming from fires all over Ephibi, but there was one huge glow over the library. Guerrilla activity, said Om. Even the slaves are fighting. Then Brother heard a hiss from the other end of the shed, a metallic whirring noise, and Urn saying, There, I told you, just a block in the tubes. The group was clustered round a boat, but there was no mast. What there was, was a large copper-coloured ball in a wooden framework. There was an iron basket underneath it, in which someone had got a good fire going. And the ball was spinning in its frame, in a cloud of steam. I've seen that, Baratha said. There was a drawing. Yes, you're right, said Didactylus, illustrating the principle of reaction. I never asked Ern to build a big one. This is what comes of thinking with your hands. Now he was closer, Baratha could see that half a dozen very short oars had been joined together in a star-shaped pattern behind the copper globe and hung over the rear of the boat. Wooden cogwheels and a couple of endless belts filled the intervening space. As the globe spun, the paddles thrashed at the air. How does it work? Very simple, said Ern. The fire makes... We haven't got time for this, said Simony makes the water hot and so it gets angry. So it rushes out of the globe through these four little nozzles to get away from the fire. The plumes of steam push the globe around and the cogwheels and Legibus's screw mechanism transfer the motion to the paddles which turn, pushing the boat through the water. Simony prodded the mechanism with his sword. Have you thought of all the possibilities? On land, perhaps on some sort of cart? Oh. Oh, no point in putting a boat on a cart. Simony's eyes gleamed with the gleam of a man who had seen the future and found it covered with armour plating. Where's the priest? Didactylus said. I'm here. You went out like a candle back there. I'm, uh, I'm better now. Remembering the scrolls okay? I, uh, I think so. Ern turned away from the boat, where he was feeding more wood into the brazier under the globe. Can we all get on board? Brother eased his way on a rough bench seat amidships. The air smelt of hot water. Right! Ern pulled a lever. The spinning paddles hit the water, there was a jerk, and the boat moved forward. What's the name of this vessel? said Didactylus. It's a boat, a thing of the nature of things. It doesn't need a name. The boat chugged out of the boathouse and into the dark harbour. The paddles churned. No wind, no rowers, said Simony. Do you even begin to understand what you have here, Ern? The things you could do with this power. It could drag Omnia kicking and screaming into the century of the fruit bat. The copper ball spun madly over the fire. It gleamed almost as brightly as Simone's eyes. Brother tapped him on the shoulder. Can I have my tortoise? There's good eating on one of these things, Simone said, fishing out Om. There was no sound but the slosh of water against the unnamed boat's hull and the spinning of the philosophical engine. There's some exiles in Ankh, said Simony. Don't worry, you'll be safe there. Brother lowered his voice to a whisper. What sort of place is Ankh? A city of a million souls, many of them occupying bodies, and a thousand religions. There's even a temple to the small gods. Not a bad place for a fresh start. With my brains and your... Well, with my brains, we should soon be in business again. Vorbis stirred the ashes with his foot. No bones. The soldiers stood silently. The fluffy grey flakes collapsed and blew a little way in the dawn breeze. And the wrong sort of ash. Be assured, I know that of which I speak. He wandered over to the charred trap door and prodded it with his toe. We uh, followed the tunnel, said the sergeant. It comes out near the docks. They're not in the city. We have searched it fully, Lord. Then they left by sea. Let us get down to the docks. Urn prodded at the copper globe with a piece of wire while the unnamed boat wallowed in the waves. The nozzles are bonged up. When the water rushes out of the globe, it leaves salt behind. Why? said Simony. Water likes to travel light. We'll be calmed. Can you do anything about it? Yes, wait for it to cool down, clean it out, and put some more water in it. But we're still in sight of the coast. You might be, said Didactylus. 
Baratha lay in the pointed end, looking down at the water. A small squid siphoned past, just under the surface. He wondered what it was, and knew it was the common bottle squid of the class Cephalopoda phyla mollusca, and that it had an internal carilaginous support instead of a skeleton. Simony and Urn were bent over the philosophical engine. Baratha stared at the globe. A sphere of radius r, which therefore had a volume v equals 4 stroke 3 pi r r r, and surface area a equals 4 pi r r minus. Oh my god. Baratha sagged to his knees in the rocking boat. The books are leaking. I don't see how that can happen, said Didactylus. You didn't read them. You don't know what they mean. They know what they mean. What's the matter with him, said Simony. He thinks he knows too much. <laughs> Priests. Mad the lot of them. Sit down, boy, said Didactylus. You're making the boat rock. We're overloaded as it is. We're ready to start again, Ern said. Just blow some water in here with the helmet, mister. And then we shall go again? Well, we can start getting up steam. He blew on the fire. Nine-tenths of Om dozed in his shell. The rest of him drifted like a fog in the real world of the gods. He thought, We're a little boat. There's the whole of the ocean. She'll probably not even notice us. Greetings, said the Queen of the Sea. Ah, I see you're still managing to exist, little tortoise. Hanging in there? There was a pause. I expect, said Om guardedly, you are looking for your price. This vessel and everyone in it. But your believer can be saved, as is the custom. What good are they to you? I mean, they've done nothing to deserve it. Deserve? They're human. What's deserve got to do with it? Om had to concede this. He wasn't thinking like a god. You've been relying on one human for too long, little god. I oh know, I oh know. Take the boat then, if you must. Om let himself retreat into the shell of his shell. Baratha? Yes? Can you swim? There, Ern said. Soon be on our way. We'd better be, said Simony. There's a ship out there. Baratha looked across the bay. A sleek, Omnian ship was passing the lighthouse. It's moving fast, said Simony. I don't understand it. There's no wind. Ern looked round at the flat calm. There can't be wind there and not here. I said... Can you swim? The voice was insistent in Baratha's head. I don't know. Do you think you can find out quickly? Ern looked upwards. Clouds had massed over the unnamed boat. They were visibly spinning. What do you call it, Ern began, when you've got a dead calm surrounded by winds? Hurricane, said Didactylus. Lightning crackled between sky and sea. Urn yanked at the lever that lowered the screw into the water. Lightning struck a few yards away. Secondary lightning sparked off the spinning globe. We're in a boat with a large copper ball in the middle of a body of salt water, said Didactylus. Thanks, Urn. The sea surged up. Jump into the water, Om shouted. Why? A wave almost overturned the boat. Rain hissed on the surface of the sphere, sending up a scalding spray. Jump overboard! Trust me! Brother stood up, holding the sphere's framework to steady himself. Sit down, said Ern. I'm just going out. I may be some time. The boat rocked as he half jumped, half fell into the boiling sea. Lightning struck the sphere. As Baratha bobbed to the surface, he saw the globe glowing white hot and the unnamed boat, its screw almost out of the water, skimming away like a comet. It vanished in cloud and rain. A moment later, there was a muffled boom. Baratha raised his hand. Om broke the surface, blowing seawater out of his nostrils. Hold me out of the water! Tortoises can't swim! A wave submerged Baratha. For a moment, the world was a dark green curtain ringing in his ears. Om! he shouted as he broke surface again. Yes! I don't think I can swim! The Sea Queen moved deep below the storm-tossed waves. The little boat had been a tempting target, she thought. But here was a bigger one, full of people sailing right into the storm. 
the Sea Queen had the attention span of an onion bargee. The fin of God plunged from wave crest to wave trough, the gale tearing at its sails. The captain fought his way through waist-high water to the prow, where Vorbis stood clutching the rail. Sir, we must reef sail! We can't outrun this! Green fire crackled on the tops of the masts. Vorbis turned. The light was reflected in the pit of his eyes. It is all for the glory of Arm. Trust is our sail, and glory is our destination. The captain had had enough. The ocean floor is our destination! Vorbis shrugged. I did not say there would not be stops along the way. Lightning struck the mainmast. There was a scream as a mass of torn sail and rigging crashed onto the deck. The captain half swam, half climbed up the ladder to the wheel, where the helmsman was a shadow in the spray. We'll never make it alive! Correct. The hull hit a submerged rock and ripped open. Balks of timber splintered and fountained up into the whirling sky. And there was a sudden velvety silence. The captain found that he had acquired a recent memory. It involved water and a ringing in his ears and the sensation of cold fire in his lungs, but it was fading. He walked over to the rail, which was greyish and slightly transparent, and looked over the side. Um, we appear to have run out of sea. Yes. And land, too. The memory of Finn of God sailed on through the silence. The captain stared down. The crew was assembling on deck, looking up at him with anxious eyes. In front of the crew, the ship's rats had assembled. There was a tiny, robed shape in front of them. It said, 